Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will open our ears and help us to listen. Open our eyes that we may see Jesus. Father, we praise you for who you are. We thank you for your awesome love, your awesome mercy. And we praise you for all that you do in our lives and all that you have given us. And Father, we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we pray that you would speak your words through our pastor this morning and that we would hear your voice and we'll give you praise and glory for all that you do. In Christ I pray. Amen. In 2003, Dateline NBC. Anybody ever watch that television show? We watch it sometimes. I think it comes on Friday nights. In 2003, Dateline NBC did a television show about what goes on at some car dealerships. They used a hidden camera to get behind the scenes, and what they discovered was an abundance of immoral and unethical behavior. Some of the stories were absolutely shocking. The show supported negative stereotypes that many of us have about car salesmen. They were pretending to offer a fair deal, but in reality, they were ripping people off. What would happen if someone followed us around with a hidden camera? What would that show look like? What would happen if someone followed us around in our cars, at work, at home, recording our conversations to be shown at a later time for all to see? What if a hidden camera followed us? What would that secret tape reveal? I'm afraid it would reveal that some of us are pretenders too. I'm afraid it might support the stereotype that, that many already have of Christians, that the church is, is, is full of hypocrites. You see, it's difficult to believe that Christianity is true when so many professing Christians live contradictory lives. But it's like the pastor that went to visit a prospect for his church. And he was visiting with him, and, and the prospect said, Pastor, I appreciate your visit. I like you. You're a nice guy. But I'm not coming to your church. The pastor said, well, why not? And he said, because I know most of the people that go to your church. And they're hypocrites. I know them. I know who they are. The pastor said, I know, I know, I know, and you know, but there's always room for one more. <laughs> we have a, a space on a pew reserved just for you. Hey, listen, we can all do better. Amen? We can all do better for the Lord. Last time we saw that Jesus spoke to the multitudes about the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of Israel. We're studying our way through. We are, are making our way through the gospel of Matthew here at Northgate. So this week we find that Jesus spoke directly to the Pharisees and the scribes, and he let them have it. In fact, this is some of the harshest language in all the Bible. And it's delivered by God, to the leaders of his chosen people. 
Think about that. We need to be careful that we are who we say we are. We need to take a good, long, hard look at ourselves. What would that hidden camera reveal about us? What if I told you there really is a hidden camera? There really is. And that, and that footage is going to be shown. It's going to be revealed one day. Write this verse down, because you're not going to believe me when I tell you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Hebrews 4 and 13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Hebrews 4, 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So what can we learn about ourselves this morning? What can we learn about how we relate to the Lord Jesus? How, what can we learn about how we relate to one another? We're going to look at eight warnings about hypocrisy in this passage of Scripture this morning. The first warning is shutting up the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 13. Jesus said, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. This lengthy passage is a literary parallel to the Beatitudes. Given in Matthew 5, 3 through 10. It's a parallel to the Beatitudes. It's a beautifully written and very powerful indictment of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And there were eight Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, and there are eight woes in Matthew 23. And you're saying, well, I've always heard about the seven woes of Jesus. I found another one this week. There's eight. Now, if you have the NIV, there's seven in the NIV or, or some other modern translations, but if you look at the King James or the New King James, there's clearly eight. So, what does this word woe mean? What is woe? Woe is what we call an interjection in, in English grammar. Like, when I first saw Tina, woe. That's spelt differently, W-H-O-A, W-H-O-A. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I get that right, Richard? Okay. Yeah. Or, man, why did I hit my finger with that hammer? That's an interjection. So, woe here is an interjection. Um, here it, it's an expression of emotion that Jesus is giving. We might have said, hey, and it wouldn't have been like, hey, how you doing, or, or hey, like horses eat. It would have been, hey, like Duck Dynasty, hey. It would have been like, hey, pay attention. I'm, I got something to tell you. It's, and here it's used as a, as a word of warning. It's used as a way to get their attention. And there are two things that we need to see here, need, need to pay attention to here right off the bat. First of all, understand, ancient Greek manuscripts had no punctuation. And all the letters were capital letters. And there were no spaces between the letters. So think about that. Think how difficult it would be to translate ancient Greek to modern translations. It's very difficult to do that. So the way that the Greeks would emphasize something would be by word placement. And whenever we see a list in the Bible, the first and the last things on that list are always the most important things. The fruit of the Spirit. What's the first? Love. What's the last? Self-control. Those are the two most important 
fruit uh, or of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We see the same with the Beatitudes. The first Beatitude, Matthew 5, 3, says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the most important one. The first one. The first woe is that the Pharisees were keeping people out of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the second thing we need to see here is this points to the central verse in the Gospel of Matthew. The central verse for Matthew is Matthew 5 and verse 20, where Jesus said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless the Pharisees and the scribes repented of their self-righteousness and trusted in the Christ, the Lord Jesus, there's no way, ain't no way they're going to heaven. Impossible. But not only for the scribes and the Pharisees, hey, that's for you too and me. Jesus Christ is the only way anyone will ever get to heaven. He said it himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So woe to anyone who would keep anyone from the kingdom of heaven. Now's a good time to do an inventory of our hearts to see if pride or hypocrisy is destroying the credibility of our witness. Well, let's move on. Secondly, fake followers. Fake, you believe there are fake followers? Jesus did. Fake followers. Look at verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Now, this is that woe that's not in the NIV. This is the lost woe. So this is the eighth woe, if you will. Um, but it's in my Bible. Listen, leaders are supposed to lead. But selfish people do things for themselves at the expense of others. We're supposed to care for widows, not rip them off. The word for pretense here is found seven times in the Bible. It means to show. The Pharisees were show-offs. That's what they were. They were show-offs. And they were showing off by giving long prayers, Jesus said. Well, that might, listen, that might impress people, but it doesn't impress God. Godly prayer is measured by depth, not length. Listen, God hates fake. God hates fake because he sees right through it. God hates fake. What we need to do is to get honest and to confess our sin and to seek his forgiveness. The hidden camera of the Holy Spirit sees all and knows all and one day will reveal all and we're going to give an account, Hebrews 4 and 13. Thirdly, double trouble. Double trouble. Look at verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he's won, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. The word proselyte there means to come over. It literally means to come over. Come over to my side. Come over, come over, Red Rover. Remember that game when you were a kid? It means to come over to my side or to convert. The Pharisees had perverted God's word with pride and hypocrisy. So they would travel all over, the Bible says, land and sea, winning people to a false religion. So the people converted to their false religion were twice as bad off as they were if they had never met a Pharisee. You see, they were already separated by God from their sins, but now they'd be separated from Him and lost in a complex legalistic cult. And that's what Jesus is teaching. 
These people would have been better off if they had never met a Pharisee. For them, it was double trouble. We see the same thing in false religion today. But the real question today is not what the Pharisees did 2,000 years ago or even the modern-day cults of our day and time. The real question is what does the hidden camera reveal about us? That's the real question. Is our faith genuine? Is it real? That's the question that matters. If we led someone to our faith, would the hidden camera reveal they found truth? What would the hidden camera reveal? Is our faith real? Fourth, blind guides. Blind guides. Look at verses 16 down through 22. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it's nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it's nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. The fourth woe reveals our values. It reveals our values. Jesus revealed one of the Pharisees' perverted values here. You see, the, the crux of the question is, are you a person of your word? That's what Jesus is saying. Are you a person of your word? Are you a trustworthy person? I want to tell you something. If you haven't already figured this out, we live in a culture that is absolutely depraved. We do. We live in a culture that is absolutely depraved. For example, in our culture, truth under oath is more true than truth. Have you ever thought about that? You ever thought about how dumb that is? We live in a culture where truth under oath is more true than truth. Well, I didn't say it under oath, so it doesn't matter. Well, you know what? It matters. Words matter. Jesus said, Matthew 5, beginning in verse 33, Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is, it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you can't make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever more than that is from the evil one. Let me tell you what, folks. Our word should be enough. And if it's not, and when it's not, we got a problem. The wisdom of our time, we talked about this last Wednesday night. God is so timely. The wisdom of our time is you better have it in writing. That's just the wisdom of our time. Instead of the wisdom of God, which says, you better do what you say. You see, that's the way it used to be. Our culture is depraved. So we better have it in writing. That's the wisdom of our time. The wisdom of God is, you better do what you say. Listen, truth is truth, whether it's under oath or not. So what does the hidden camera reveal about the validity of, the trustworthiness of our word. Well, fifthly, you've been looking forward to this one. Tithing is easy. You saw that one on the outline. Admit it, you did. You saw it. Mm. 
All right, Matthew 23, 23 and 24. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise. That's the only, I guess that's anise. I don't, you know, I couldn't figure out how to, how to pronounce it. That's the only place in the Bible this word is used. And I, you figure out, if you, I tell, if you want to correct me, come up here and say it correctly. Mint and anise, anise or a n i s e and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. The tithe is mentioned. How many times you guess in the Bible in the New Testament? Seven. The tithe is mentioned seven times in the New Testament. Once in Matthew, twice in Luke, four times in Hebrews. And every time it's mentioned, it's mentioned as though it's assumed. So I'm not going to assume that we all know what a tithe is. A tithe is 10% of our gross income that goes to the Lord through His church. So, if I've heard this one once, I've heard it a hundred times. So why is the tithe on the gross? Why did, I, why did I say gross instead of net income? Because before a law was passed that's called the Current Tax Payment Act of 1943 in the middle of World War II, before that law was passed, there was no such thing as net pay. Before 1943, it was just pay. That 1943 tax law started employer payroll withholding. So it's gross pay. God uses the tithe to fund His will on earth through His church. And Jesus considered this to be elementary. Jesus assumes His followers tithe. Now, the Pharisees were so legalistic that they tithed right down to the herbs in their pantry. I mean, that's what Jesus is saying. They gave 10% of their herbs. They probably gave 10% of the socks out of their sock drawer. They were legalistic. And notice, Jesus didn't condemn them for it. He condemned them for doing the easy thing while neglecting the hard thing. Giving a tenth of what we get to God is the easy thing. Hard, the hard thing is, is, are, are things like justice and mercy and faith. Tithing is elementary in our faith. Seriously. Tithing is the easy part. The hard part is doing justice and being merciful and living by faith. The easy part of that is tithing. The hard thing is treating others like we'd want to be treated even though they've spitefully hurt us and persecuted us and used us. It's easy to be prideful. It's easy to be hypocritical. Humility is tough. What does the hidden camera reveal about the integrity of our faith? Sixth, the sixth woe, dirty dishes. Dirty dishes. Look at verses 25 and 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Canon used to sell their cameras with a very famous, very successful sales slogan, image is everything. Canon sold a lot of cameras using that sales slogan. That would have been the Pharisees' slogan too because to them, image was everything. Listen. Every man, most men, because men don't wear coat and tie as often as we used to. 
But every man from, t- from time to time in our lives will wear a coat and tie. Men, I want to help you here. We try to give practical help at Northgate. We we'll try to help you. If you've got to wear a dress shirt like I did today, and you don't have anyone to iron it for you, then, then the only part you've got to worry about ironing is the front part. Because look, you wear the wide tie, and you keep your, listen, listen, you keep your jacket on. That's etiquette. But it just makes sense. Because if you, then all you got to do is just iron the front part of your shirt. Doesn't matter whether the, you don't know <laughs> if the sleeves are wrinkled. Or the back side of the shirt is red. doesn't matter because folks can't see that. All that matters is what people can see. Image is everything. You drink coffee? I'm help. I'm giving you tons of useful life information here. You drink coffee? Always drink coffee. Don't you ever let anyone give you a coffee cup that's anything but white. Okay. Always drink coffee from a white cup. And always look inside of it before they pour the coffee. (laughs) Because you can see the dirty stuff. You can make sure it's clean. The Pharisees appeared to be outwardly conformed to the law, but they were inwardly corrupt to God. You see, hypocrisy maximizes the show And it minimizes the corruption. That's what it does. Until we start digging deeper. And getting to know someone better. Hypocrisy maximizes the show and minimizes the corruption. From the inside out, we need to clean up the filthy dishes in our lives. The dirty dishes. From the inside out. Well, seven, whitewashed tombs. Look at verses 27 and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. One of the worst things that you could do if you were a Jew is to touch a dead body. Touching a dead body meant that you were defiled. And you had to go through a time, a period of cleansing. And that was a hassle. It was, it was, it was very time consuming and very complex. But it's interesting, in the New Testament, Jesus touched dead bodies. We know of at least two examples. He touched the dead body of the daughter of Jairus. He touched the dead body of of the widow's son at Nain. So Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs full of dead dead men's bones. You see, they weren't just touching the dead. That's who they were. That's what he's saying. They were dead men. And this is about, this is about as insulting as Jesus ever got with the Pharisees. No one had ever spoke so bluntly and so boldly about hypocrisy to the Pharisees before. Again, like their dirty dishes, they looked all nice and impressive on the outside, but on the inside they were filthy and defiled. And Jesus exposed the filth. He exposed the truth. That's what the... That's what the Lord Jesus does. The light of the Lord Jesus exposes the filth in our lives. And for us to boast about all that we do for God instead of all that God has done for us is hypocritical. You see, righteousness flows from the inside out. So what would the hidden camera reveal about the hidden things in our lives? 
Are we alive in the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are we like whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones? Well, finally, escaping hell. Look at verses 29 through 36. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteousness of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. Wow. Did you catch that little phrase in that verse? On you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the righteous blood of, of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah. No kin to me. Whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. The eighth woe dovetails perfectly with the eighth beatitude. Read the Beatitudes and then read the, the eight woes and see how they, especially the first and the last. Matthew 5, 10, the last of the Beatitudes, says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, true people of God will be persecuted for teaching the Word of God. They always have been, even now especially now. And Jesus accused the Pharisees of spilling the innocent blood of the true prophets of God. They did. He saw them. They looked conveniently the other way when Herod killed John the Baptist. They just allowed it to happen. They were about to nail Jesus to the cross. And Jesus had just revealed the true identity of the Pharisees. They weren't friends of God. They were enemies of God. And if Jesus was saying, if God were to heap up all of the innocent blood, shed of all time, and hold them accountable for it, if God were to hold them accountable for all the murders, and all the massacres, and all the wars of all time, all of that shed blood of all time wouldn't even begin to compare to what they were about to do. That's what he's saying. Because they were about to nail the Christ to a cross. Now it's interesting that Jesus would invoke two names here. Abel and Zechariah. Abel, of course, is the son of Adam who was murdered by his brother Cain. You know the story of Abel. Zechariah is a, is a mystery. You don't know who Zechariah is. I don't know. No one knows for sure. Even though Jesus gives us his daddy's name, Berechiah, we still don't know who he was for sure. No one does. But that's the point. Jesus did that on purpose. Listen, he made the book, but we don't know anything about him. And that's on purpose. His was the tomb of the unknown soldier of the cross. Abel, we all know. Zerechiah was the tomb of the unknown soldier of the cross. We don't know who he was. We don't know how he died. But we know exactly, this is interesting, we know exactly where he died, and we know who killed him. The Pharisees killed him with their legalism, and he died between the temple and the altar. He was a holy man, killed in a holy place, by unholy men. And then Jesus asked a fascinating, a great question. He asked, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? 
And he asked that question of the scribes and the Pharisees. But I got news for you folks. He also asked it of us. He asked it of us. How can we escape the condemnation of hell? And the only answer to that question is Jesus Christ. No one will escape the condemnation of hell apart from the forgiveness of our sins by the redeeming blood of, and, the, and the risen power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scribes and the Pharisees missed heaven because they ignored the Christ. We don't have to. We don't have to. We don't have to, so please don't. Escaping hell and receiving heaven is as simple as dying to ourselves and living for the Lord Jesus. And that begins by confessing our sin to God, admitting our need for His help, by repenting of our sin and trusting the Lord Jesus that He died on the cross to, to forgive us our sins. He rose from the dead on the third day to give us new life. And by committing all that we are, all that we have, to the Lord Jesus, the Savior and the Lord of our lives. Romans, Romans 10 and verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll escape the condemnation of hell. The Pharisees, this is what this is about. They miss the Christ. And the good news is, we don't have to. We don't have to. So come to Jesus. What will the hidden camera, what will the Holy Spirit at the end of the age reveal about who we really are? Now we know who the scribes and the Pharisees really were. Matthew 23 tells us. What will the hidden camera reveal about you? About me? Because one day, that film is going to air. And the only way to have forgiveness is through the blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We pray right now that you would penetrate our hearts with truth. We recognize that this, Lord, this very moment, it's such an opportunity, such a blessing. It's an opportunity for us to come to the Father. Through the Son, the Lord Jesus, by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that we might escape the condemnation of hell. That we might receive the free gift of eternal life in heaven. So God, convict us and move upon us. Draw us to you. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're here today and, and, and there's never been a time in your life when you've given your life truly and honestly to the Lord. Maybe the Holy Spirit showed you some of that film this morning. And you want to come and you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus. You want to, to be sure that you escape the condemnation of hell. There's only one way and that's through Jesus. Jesus says there's only one way. John 14 and verse 6. So you come. Maybe you want to rededicate your life. Maybe there's too much show, not enough truth. You come. Rededicate. Recommit your days, your time. However God is speaking, He's speaking. However He's speaking, we need to be honest. We need to be open to the Lord to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Richard, come and lead us in an invitation hymn. Would you please stand?